If anybody has a reason to sing, we do, we do. If anybody has a reason to sing, we do, oh, we do. Let's praise the Lord, let's praise the Lord, let's praise the Lord, let's praise the Lord. of worship and in our time of study on today we're going to talk further about the reasons for our conviction we're spending time in the next few installments on the word of god there is no source like the word of god nothing like the bible and we want to talk about i want to spend some time studying why the bible matters i, I really pray my goal at the end of this study is for you and i to walk away with that much more conviction about loving the word of God, reading the word of God, studying the word of God, being confident in the word of God, not being ashamed of the word of God, reading it wherever you are, among whomever you're around, growing in your faith in why the word of God matters, why the Bible matters. And especially in a season like now where we need to hear promises, we need to know principles. We need to understand the reasons why we hold on to what we hold on to. What are the convictions that we have? Why do we believe what we believe? Why do we practice like we practice? Why are we still worshiping? Why are we still moving forward? Why not throw our hands up and give up? Well, we know what we know and we believe what we believe because it comes from the word of God. We believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it is from the mouth of God. And everything that we do is centered around that conviction. So we want to dive in and know why the word of God matters. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to work from a title, Give Me the Bible. The, the word of God, the Christian worldview, 
is founded on, sustained by the historical reliability and the actual reliability of the Bible, the word of God. Everything that we do is based on this book, this book that was developed over 1500 years, written by or contributed to by 40 different authors, three major languages. Uh, three different regions of the world, three major epochs of human history, all sustaining and containing one amazing redemptive narrative from the beginning of human history to the end of the book of Revelation and while we're waiting even right now on the summation of the world. The Bible is, in fact, an amazing collection of literature made up of different genres, different styles, different types, different types of contributors from poets to politicians to farmers to individuals that were, 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 were regular men called out of the world and called to be used by God, all driven by, uh, inspired by the spirit of God to develop a work that would attest that it is in fact the word of God and in attesting that it is the word of God, so prove that there is a God, there was an individual named Jesus, who is the son of God, the Holy Spirit superintended the entire narrative. And this book called the Bible can be relied upon because it has divine origin and redemptive power. We believe that the Bible is in fact, the word of God. It is the foundation for our thinking. It frames the process for anyone that wants to be called a disciple. We call it scripture. We call it the faith. We call it the gospel. We call it the good book. It is the Bible. It is a library of 60 six books by those 40 contributors that all amazingly tell one redemptive narrative. We believe that the Bible gives us hope. It is a light in our dark places. It's, it's wisdom for life. It's power for today. Gives us promises for tomorrow. Proof for our convictions. And it is a personal work from the creator to the creature. Now, what should we do with that? With that kind of book, you and I ought to have the kind of conviction that says, as a follower of God, I'm going to remember that the word of God is pure. I know that it has been tested. It is powerful. It stands forever. It's a lamp and a light unto my path. It is the revealed will of God to man. I shouldn't add to it or take away from it. I ought to delight in the word of God, meditate on the word of God, treasure the word of God, learn the word of God, be perfected by the word of God, incline my ear to the word of God, rejoice over the word of God and never, ever neglect the word of God. We believe that the Bible is the word of God and we ought to hold on to it like none other. So our purpose, our purpose for today, our, our purpose in our study on today is to contend for the significance of the Bible as the word of God and how it enhances and undergirds the Christian worldview. And I want to do that so that we acknowledge the prominence of the scriptures, so that we hold on to the power, so that we live in the practical application of the word of God. And we allow that to color and, and, and direct every part of our life. And in order to do this, I want to work through at least Three major points on today, right from your notes, and I want our time to be built around looking at the significance of why this book, why the Bible matters to the believer, why you and I ought to treasure the word of God. And I really want to challenge you. If you're not someone who regularly reads the word of God, if you don't spend time opening up the book and reading it every single day, my prayer is that you don't move past this study by being an individual that can go a day without the word of God. You and I, ought to be like Jesus that simply remembers that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. We ought to be like Job that says, I treasure and want your word more than my daily sustenance. We, we ought not want to live and move through a day where we've heard more from other individuals or we know more about other things than we do the word of God. Our challenge and my goal in preaching and teaching this word to you is that you and I wake up and hunger for the word of God, that you don't feel right moving through the day without having read some of what God says, that you need to hear a word from your God. Has he spoken to you today? Have you heard from him today? Have you learned from him today? Have you gained a word from him today? Do you have a principle that blesses your life? Is there something disturbing your spirit out of the word of God today? If not, let today be the day that you change and say, I want to make a commitment that I'm living by and nourished by and moving by the power of the word of God.
God. It is significant. It is extremely important. And the believer ought not want to live their life without hearing from their creator. So I want to walk through this lesson and, and, and I pray that you'll be you'll be better as a result of it. let me give you point number one. Point number one, the word of God is the standard for knowledge. The word of God is the standard for knowledge. We believe that the only means for really understanding the thinking of God can come from the matters that are shared throughout the word of God. All of life, truth be told, is unpacked through you and I understanding what the word of God says. So, so the creature then, you and I, have to learn how to be a people who appreciate and know that the standard for real knowledge comes out of the word of God. God's thoughts are not going to be contained in the mind of another man. God's thoughts won't be found by you and I studying nature. We won't understand the thinking of God by, by some kind of university curriculum. The only way we can really know what God thinks and what God's mind is and the knowledge that God contains about this thing called the human condition is by studying scripture. Look with me at Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 13. It's in your notes. Hear the word of God at Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 13. Watch the text. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands instead of thorns bush uh, instead of the thorn bush the cypress will come up and instead of the nettle and myrtle myrtle will color come up and it will be a memorial to the lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off that's isaiah 55 verses 8 through 13 now i want you to notice something in the text isaiah grabs a horticultural motif that describes the power of the word of god in the in the word of god every time we open it every time you hear it every time it is read one of the most amazing Amazing things about the word of God is that it is missional. It is always ministering and it is marvelous in its effect. What do you mean? Whenever you and I grope at the knowledge that comes from the mind of God in the word of God, you need to know this about God's work. Every time we open the Bible, read the Bible, understand what God wants us to understand. God says you cannot walk away from my word without being made better. In other words, every time you read the word of God, it is on assignment. Every time you hear the word of God, it is on assignment. Showing again the power that, that the scripture has. It is not a human origin. It is not designed by man. It comes from God. And whether you are reading it, hearing it, listening to it, no matter what, every time that word is proclaimed, every time it is shared, it's as if it is sent on mission by God. And when you and I open up the word of God, it is on assignment and watch God's promise. It will not return to me void without doing what I've told it to do. It is missional in its intent. When God allowed the word of God to be written and preached and taught and sown and shared, he helps us to appreciate that my mind will always affect change in the lives of the creature. It is just as if you and I are walking with God in the cool of the day, in the cool of the garden, learning from him about the matters of life and and God makes this promise. Anytime you walk with God through studying the word of God and reading the word of God, you are made better as a result of it. It will not return void. It is missional in nature. But then in addition to that, it is ministering. Watch God's word. God's word affects change in the heart and lives of the believer like rain on the ground or snow on the ground. What does rain and snow do to the soil? 
It, it nourishes and sustains. It feeds and, and, and treats. It gives vitality and life. It, it allows the soil to drink up that which will cause it to produce what it's supposed to produce. We then, like soil, whenever we hear the word of God, grow in our potential to produce what God has designed us to produce. Perhaps one of the reasons why your life seems stagnant and your mind seems, seems still is because you haven't been drinking in soaking in the word of God but I promise you whenever the word of God is shared in your life God will always make you better he will make you more potentially fruitful he will bless your life to be effective in whatever he's called you to be effective for it is missional the word of God it is ministering the word of God but it's also marvelous God's word and the knowledge of God that comes from the word of God will change everything about the setting or the context of the individual that receives it notice the text again the word will go forth it'll do what it's going to do it won't return without succeeding in the matter God sent it in but then watch he gives this metaphor or he uses this illustration it's like a jubilee illustration at the end of verses 12 and 13 the mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you the trees of the field will clap their hands instead of thorn bushes cypress will come up instead of nettle myrtle will come up it will be a memorial to the Lord an everlasting sign which will not be cut off watch God talk God is simply saying where you find that there were places that were dry and worthless and thorn like I'll make it like myrtle I will bless it to be a, a cypress instead it will be medicinal in value. It will be healing in value. God, what are you saying? I'm saying I can change your life for being fruitless and purposeless and mundane and regular and I can bless you to be a blessing to everybody around you. That's God talking. I can make you move from thorn like to cypress like move you from nettles to myrtle. I can bless you to be the kind of individual that's like an astringent to wounded places like healing to places that need balm. Can't you imagine how awesome it is that every time you and I drink in the word of God and learn the knowledge of God, we become more salt like and light like can you hear Jesus you are the salt of the earth you are the light of the word of God if the salt loses its savor what's the promise of God the more of God's word knowledge of God you have in your life the more effective he makes you as salt and as light. God can bless us to be better in the context that we're in by knowing more of the creator who put us there so the word of God is our standard for knowledge according to Isaiah. Let me move on though. Not only do you see from Isaiah, and I don't, don't, don't miss this, you see from Isaiah that the word of God is missional, ministering, and marvelous as the knowledge of God. But then in addition to that, the word of God is also the only standard for us knowing God's truth. Remember, it's our place of grabbing the knowledge of God. You won't know anything about the mind of God without studying the word of God. But in like fashion, you and I won't know how to process life through truthful lenses separate and apart from the word of God. Hear me. The way that we look at life and the way we process life is, is basically called your worldview. And your worldview is sustainable to be effective and beneficial if the lenses that make up your word, your worldview are truthful. If they are false, you will process life in a false way. But if it's true, you will always be liberated because your understanding about life and the happenings of life will be built on, based on, founded on what thus saith the Lord. Now, why in the world would anybody want their worldview, worldview to be founded on the truthfulness of the word of God? Because if your worldview is not founded on truth, it will be based on a lie or a lesser standard. Either way, you and I won't have the best worldview one could have. Hear Jesus talking. Jesus said in John chapter 8, in verse number 30 through 32, as he was speaking these things, many came to him and he said this. He said to those that were, that were following him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth and the truth 
will make you free. Notice, notice running back up from the text. By the way, this is in the same context where Jesus later on would talk about uh, Satan himself. And he would talk about the contrast between those that follow after the Lord versus those that are willing to be duped and manipulated by the enemy. But here in this text, he says, if you really want to be a follower of him, notice the contingency. If you and I are claiming to be disciples of Jesus, we must continue in the word of God. You can't say you are a follower of the Lord and don't love his word. You can't claim to be a Christian, one who loves God and comes after God, but you don't have an affinity and a love for God's word. And in like fashion, when you and I know the word of God, when I spend time reading the word of God, when I spend time with the word of God laid up in my mind, God blesses me. Psalm 119 verse number 11, your word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin. Now watch what that does. That frees me from error. It frees me from lies. It frees me from, let me give you another way why the truth will let you or set you free. When I've got truth running through my mind and filling my mind, truth will free me from the lie of anxiety. Truth will free me from the lie of living life like someone who has no hope. Truth will free me from the concept of being brought down and brought low or having low self-esteem or not appreciating who I am. No, ma'am and no, sir. When you know the truth, you walk around with your head up and you don't let anybody lie to you about who you are. You don't let somebody lie and tell you that you're here as a product of chance. No, I'm created by God. You don't let somebody say that God's not involved in what's going on in the world today. No, ma'am and no, sir. Even if man had a hand in what's going on or even if they did not I know this my God is always with me always guiding me right here with me right now and nothing will separate me from the love of God that's the truth that frees me from walking around as if I have no hope that's the truth that liberates me and allows me to lift my head up every day that God gives me that's the truth that allows me to say goodbye to my loved one who died in the Lord because they really didn't die that living on with the Lord to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord the truth is the child of God does not die that's the truth and you can be liberated by that truth or you can be ignorant in the word of God and not know how to function as a Christian. So God wants us to have truth. Jesus said, you are my disciples if you know and study the word of God and you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, if an individual does not have that truth. They don't have the word of God. They are still imprisoned both by a lie or the human condition. They are imprisoned by falsehoods. They are imprisoned by things that will bring them low and allow them to not have the liberty and the freedom that God wants them to have. Yet what we've learned in this first point is that the word of God is the standard for knowledge. And that knowledge is both what comes from the mind of God, Isaiah 55, and from reading and studying the, the teaching and the word of our Lord, which watch what he says again. If you are my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You and I can be free from a false paradigm or a false worldview and have the knowledge and truth that comes from knowing God's word. Only the creature who understands the reality that's established by God. God can live in a way where they are liberated from the lies of the world and stand founded on what thus saith the Lord. Let me give you another point too. What, when we define truth as that which pertains to reality, here's the thing that you want to remember. God is the one who created the world. God is the one who's holding the world together. God is the one who's in direct control. God is the one who's responsible for your every heartbeat, your every heartbeat the breath that you take, the fact that your mind is functioning as it is, and every, every vibe part of your body. God's in direct control. God is with you as you as you're in the body. God will be with you when you leave the body. Everything about your reality has God all over it. If you don't know God's word, you will not know the truth about your own existence. And if you don't know the truth about your own existence, you will be imprisoned by a false paradigm, a lie either from the enemy or from the fail, fruitless, fickle mentality of man themselves instead of being free to know what God would have you to know. Let me give you point number two, though. Point number two. Not only number one is the word of God, the standard for knowledge. The word of God is significant in its reach. Thomas, what do you mean by significant in its reach? Remember this about the word of God. 
the Bible is not a regular document. It's not a magazine. It's not a history book. It's not, it's not um, a newspaper. The Bible is a living document. It's a collection of works that are superintended by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, because the Holy Spirit is involved not only in its inception and conception and development altogether, everything about the word of God is living. It, it has the power to affect change. And as a living document, as a living oracle, as a word that comes from God himself, we need to hold on to the reality that the power of the word of God or the intrusive, invasive, invasive kind of impact of the word of God is like God himself. Only the word can reach into the dimensions of our existence that correspond to the one who made us. In other words, we are body, soul, spirit. I am a soul with a spirit living in a body. So what you see isn't really who I am. Only the word of God can reach past the shell, past the tent, through my emotions and get to the real me. Only the word of God has the power to change what nobody else can change. Only the word of God can touch and, 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 and move and, and bother the aspects of the human dimension that nobody else can give. You know this as full as well as I know. You can sit right in front of somebody and, and, and you can be there in front of them and you can have a still face just looking at them, just looking at them real stern, looking at them. And y'all can sit there and look at each other and, and, and both of y'all can have a look on your face, but nobody knows what's going on in the mind of the other individual except for that individual. Why? Because I can't get there unless you let me there. I can't see there unless you let me know what's going on there. But here's the thing about the word of God. God's word as a living, powerful, intrusive, invasive source that comes directly from God does not have to ask permission to touch and reach and grab and meet you at those spaces that nobody else can see. God's word has the power of getting inside to the real you and touching and changing what really goes on in the deepest part of who you are. Can't you hear Hebrews chapter 4 verse number 12 and verse number 13? For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul, spirit, joint, and marrow and is a discerner of the very thought and intent of the heart. Notice this about the word of God. God's word is like a scalpel that cuts directly into the soul of the individual. But watch what it does. He's so amazing at what he does that he pierces even to the division of, watch this, the soul and the spirit joined and marrow. There is no scalpel on the face of the planet that can cut the soul. No scalpel on the face of the planet that can cut the division of the soul and the spirit. But God's word can go deeper than joint and marrow, deeper than muscle and sinew, deeper than tissue and epidermis and can cut the very soul and heart of the individual. Watch it. And it not only can cut the soul and the heart, it can change and it can it can create discernment in the thoughts, your thinking and intention, your will. God's word has the ability to meet you in your mind and change it for God's agenda. Only the power of the word of God, only this amazing living document can reach you and grab a hold of a part of you that nothing else can grab like God can grab. No wonder, no wonder the word of God would say in Luke 24 verses 13 through all the way to the end of the text when they were talking with Jesus and you see them reading the word of God, how the Bible describes every time they had a study of the word of God, an encounter over a discussion of the word of God. The text says, did our hearts not burn within us? They weren't talking about they weren't talking about eating the wrong thing and burping up some stuff. They were talking about how their spirit and their soul was on fire because of a discussion, an encounter, a meeting up with the word of God. God's word has the power of creating and changing and blessing your thoughts. If you've ever wondered why after reading the word of God and you, you get to a place where it, 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 it meets you right where you need to be met and you, you just have those moments when you're in the Psalms and you just, mm, oh, that was, oh, that was a good word. You might not even know why it was a good word. You might not even know why it hits you like it hits you, why it touched you like it touched you. But one thing I can let you know, a living word like a living individual can touch your spirit in ways that nobody else can. 
And that's the power of the word of God. But not only is it intrusive and invasive and impactful to your spirit, God's word, like a living oracle, is significant because it reaches your very psyche and allows you to see in yourself what nobody can tell you except for the scripture. James chapter one, verse number 21 through 25. Again, another beautiful text where there he says, Putting aside all filthiness and, and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Watch this, though, verse 22. But prove yourself a doer of the word and not merely a hearer deluding yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself, goes his way and immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in all of what he does. Watch what the word of God does. I love it because James opened up King James, wherefore lay apart all filthiness superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able that's the power to save your soul but then he says but be a doer of the word not a hearer only for everyone who's a hearer of the word and not a doer is like someone who looks in a mirror now watch 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 the metaphor just like the word of God is like a scalpel cutting to cut the soul and the spirit of an individual. Just like the word of God, it's like it's like a farmer who sows the seed and the rain that drenches the soil and, and affects change in the word of God. Here you find that the word of God, the significance and the reach of the word of God is like a mirror to your soul. And you know what it's like. You know what you like when you're getting up in the morning and you're getting all coordinated and all fresh and fly and all that kind of stuff. And you laid out and you ready to go and you stand in front of the mirror. You know how y'all do the profile and you looking in the mirror. Yeah, that look good. That's yeah, that's right there. That's mm -hmm, that's good right there. I know I look good. Yeah, that's fly. And you you going on doing all that there in front of the mirror. Well, the word of God hits you a little differently. You know, those moments in the mirror. Can we talk for just a minute? You know, those moments in the mirror where, where you see you see a blemish. You see. You see a dimple, you see some stuff, and you look. Ooh, mm, I need to, I need to work on that. I need to, need to tighten that up. Okay, probably going to get these sit ups in. Let me, let me get back on my my regiment. Let me, oh, mm, I really do need to back away from the bread. Bless the Lord. I, all, all of those kind of moments. If you can see that with the physical body. Imagine how the Word of God, like a mirror. Shows you the ugliness of your soul. How God will show you how dark your thinking is. How, how inconsistent with his mind your mind is. How wretched your thoughts are. Imagine musing into that mirror. And as the text says, who looks thereon. Who, who deeply takes a look and, and spends time looking intently into that word and you see all those areas that are inconsistent with his mind. You know how that makes you feel when you see the blemish, you see the ugliness, you see the wrongfulness. Only the word of God can open up the mirror to your soul and show you every place that needs to be made right. But the power of the word of God is not just that he'll open up and show you where you are inconsistent, but watch, he gives it right back. Look at the word of God. He's got to look there on that individual who doesn't just go away and forget what manner of man he was, but he looks intently, looks desirously, and is willing to make application. The same book that will show you where you're wrong is the same book, same word that will tell you how to make it right. You and I are blessed with a source from the word of God. Watch what it does. It will always make you better because you hear the mind of God. It will always change your life as you address and, uh, and receive the word of God. It will always cut you as you open the word of God. It will always show you as you look at the word of God. But then God in his amazing law of liberty. Look at that. The law of that you have to be made free from by studying. Can you hear Jesus now? You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yes, God will free me from wrong thinking, free me from bad behavior, free me from things that are inconsistent, but he gives me the free will to affect and accept that change also. God will never hold you hostage. 
He will never force you to become what you don't want to become. But he does invite you. He invites you to receive. He invites you to accept. He invites you to take on. Can you hear him? Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness or putting aside all filthiness and that which remains of wickedness and receive with meekness. Humbly receive this word that has the power to save your soul. Listen, we've studied two things on today, and I'm, I'm landing right here. We've looked at two major points, and I'm going to come back the next week. We're, we're coming back next week and keep staying in the Word of God, but I want you to walk away with this. Hear me. The Word of God, your challenge on today, the Word of God is the standard for God's knowledge. And number two, the Word of God is significant in its reach. I dare you. I dare you. I dare you. Every day this week, I dare you. Every day this week, spend some time reading the Word of God. Don't overthink it. Just get in the Word. Let that Word change your life. Read through the gospel. Watch the life of Jesus. Read through the epistles. Hear the teaching of the apostles. Read the word of God in the Psalms. Let the words spill over your spirit and bless you. Let it move you. Let it change you. Let it touch you. I dare you to read the word of God before you watch TV. Read the word of God before you get on social media. Read the word of God before you turn your favorite music station on. Read the word of God before you get on TikTok, Snapchat, any of that. Read the word of God before you let anything else eclipse you. Read the word of God before you put something in your mouth. Let God's word be the first thing on your tongue, the first thing in your mind, the first thing in your spirit. Let God's word arrest your attention and bridle your conscience. Let God's word make you better than how he found you. Let God's word refine your thinking. Watch God's word change you into something you can't even see in yourself unless you get in the mirror and stay in it and allow yourself to humbly receive it. Let God's word Bless you to be more and more like Christ. And let me conclude right here for those of us that are here. Maybe you're, 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 you're studying with us and you're seeking. You just want to know, what in the world do I need to do to meet up with this God you're talking about? This God that gave this living oracle. This God that really, really wants us to be free and liberated and, 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 and right in our mind and our heart. Let me just tell you what you need to do right this minute. If you haven't done it as much, you need to, in the word of God, we're promised to see this amazing love story from God. God so loved the entire world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3 and verse number 16. We know that text. But God gave his son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life God didn't send his son to condemn the world but he gave his son so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life even his son says or it's said of his son in John chapter 1 same book back up two chapters he came into his world in this world but the world received him not but as many as received him to them gave he power to become sons and daughters of God John 1 and verse number 12 and that same son Jesus says the thief comes John 10 verses 10 the thief comes but to steal kill and destroy I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly the same book John 20 verse 30 and 31 many other things truly did Jesus do in the presence of his disciples which are not written in that book but those things are written that you might believe and that by believing you might have eternal life God wants you saved in believing in Jesus and everyone that really believes in Jesus is willing to give their life back to him the first time any individual became a Christian they believed in Jesus. Peter preached a message about Jesus. He said, men of Israel, hear these words. Again, scripture. Jesus of Nazareth, a man of God approved among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised from the dead because it was impossible that the grave should hold him. Notice what Peter does. He preaches the death of Jesus. Well, his life, he was among you. You saw him. He did miracles. He was taken and murdered. That's his death. He was buried right there and y'all saw him. That's his burial. He was resurrected and you you saw that he walked around among us and as a resurrected Lord whom the, the apostles were preaching and teaching. Watch what they learned. 36 of Acts chapter 2. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know this for sure. God made that same Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. When the audience heard this, they recognized they were guilty. They were pricked in their heart, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Watch what Peter tells these individuals to do who acknowledged that they were sinful in a guilty distance from God, 
who acknowledged that Jesus was, in fact, the Lord and Christ, who acknowledged that they just want to be saved. Watch what he tells them to do from the scripture. Acts chapter two, verse 38. Peter says to everyone, therefore, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for what, Peter, for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And watch Peter talk. And with many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, save yourselves. What Peter just told them is the key to what salvation, how you grab salvation. God wants you saved, John 3, 16. Jesus wants you saved, John 10 and 10. The Bible is written so that you'll believe it, John 20, 30, 31. But the instructions for salvation are right here in Acts chapter two for the first example of people being Christians. Repent, 2, 38, be baptized. Who? Every one of you. For what? Forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you will have the promise of God. Now, did they do it? Verse 41 says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Then the text goes on and says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Verse 47, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. When you and I simply do what the scripture says, this living word that's a standard for knowing God and, and significant for the deepest reach of our lives. When we just do what it says, God will bless us to have the salvation that only he can offer. And my promise is if we just receive with meekness the engrafted word, God is able to save your soul. Listen, your challenge, if you're not saved, get that. If you're in the body of Christ and you have not been living your life where every day you read, love, study, muse on and grow from the word of God, you ought to change that now. Repent and do better. Why? Because God's word is the only way we're really going to have life. Jesus, our Lord, said man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of of God. Job said, I want his word more than my daily sustenance. The psalmist says, your word have I laid up in my heart so that I will not sin. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word is forever established and all of it together is the truth. When you and I live on the word of God, God will make us better. We'll know his thoughts, we'll know his mind, and we will become like our father. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you and we bless you for being our God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the significance of your word. We pray, oh God, that you bless us to have an appetite for your word where every single day we wake and thirst and hunger and come after you and your word. Bless us, Lord God, to live in such a way where we are impacted and desirous of growing deeper in our walk with you, deeper in our relationship with you. Change us to be better than how you found us and help us, Lord God, to celebrate you in all of what what we do. We love you. We honor you. We magnify you. God, I pray that your word right now reaches someone who needs you desperately, someone who just wants to be saved, someone who's really in this moment, this, this season that we're in, they just want to make sure that their life is in alignment with you. And if Lord God, they are not bless them to come after and study and hear the word of God and what it and it alone says so that they can be saved before it is everlastingly too late. We love you. We thank you. We honor you. We praise and magnify you. Thank you for just one more day to give you honor and worship. We kiss at your feet. Help us to rise and walk in power even right now. And we ask all this in Jesus name as we together say amen. Listen, I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you please pray for me and let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you. God has on me.